Welcome to lecture 7.1, the heat equation. This is the first example that we will see of a partial differential equation, or a PDE, which is a differential equation of a multivariate function, typically a function involving position x and time t. Indeed, the heat equation will consist of a function u that describes the temperature of a bar at position x and time t. The topic of PDEs is very deep and involved, and you can take an entire graduate or undergraduate level class on it, and it's a popular area of current research as well. Now we will just see an introduction. We will see some basic PDEs, the heat equation, wave equation, transport equation, and Laplace's equation, and we will emphasize the modeling and the physical situations that they describe. This is probably my favorite part of the class, and I have heard students who have taken my class express a similar sentiment. So I know I mentioned it in the previous slide, but it's important enough to write down. If u is a two-variable function of position and time, then a partial differential equation, or a PDE, is an equation involving u, the variables, and the partial derivatives of u. So let's take a moment to compare PDEs versus ODEs. Now ODEs have a unifying theory of existence and uniqueness of solutions. Well, not all ODEs, they have to be, I mean, certain types do. Um, for example, linear ODEs, and especially when you have initial value problems. We have a nice theory of solutions there. For example, if, if we have a, let me just write down an ODE, y prime equals sine of t times y equals, or not, I can't do equals twice, plus 3, something like this. Um, then this has a one-parameter family of solutions. And if we further specify that y of 0 equals 5, then we have a unique solution. If we have a second-order equation, y double prime minus 1 over t times y plus um, e to the t y equals 4, then this is going to have a two-parameter family of solutions involving C1 and C2. Now, if we specify initial conditions, the initial position, the initial, say, rate of change, or velocity, now we have a unique solution. And these things are both initial value problems. Now, in contrast, say IVP, because boundary value problems are more unpredictable. We saw in the previous lecture this boundary value problem, and we'll see this more later in this lecture, y double prime equals negative n squared y, where y of 0 equals y of pi equals 0. We saw that this thing has, does not have a unique solution. This has infinitely many solutions. So we have yn of, let's say, x, because it's a boundary value problem, we have a solution um, sine of nx for, for any integer n. So here we have infinitely many solutions. So not all ODEs, not all classes of ODEs have um, a nice theory of solutions, but there's a lot of classes that do, namely the linear ODEs and then when we have initial turn them into initial value problems. PDEs have no such theory. Given a PDE, it's often a big question as to, are there even solutions that exist? And if so, how many? So this is one reason why PDEs is such a hot area, of, a popular area of research, is because anytime a PDE comes up, these questions are fundamental and, and they're unknown. Um, and also PDEs arise from physical phenomena and modeling. We're gonna look at the heat equation, the wave equation, that's why these things come up, and that's another reason why they are so popular in modeling in math, science, and engineering. Here's the heat equation in its full generality. So we have a, a bar of length L. So let me, let me sketch that like this. This is L and this is 0. Insulated along its interior. So let me sketch that by drawing some sort of maybe foam covering. And the reason for this is because because we want heat to go 
left and right, we only in one dimension. We don't want to consider the case where heat escapes from the bar. So the heat equation is this PDE right here, where u, the function u, which is here and here, represents the temperature of the bar at position x and time t. And then rho, sigma, and kappa, these things that appear here, are the density, specific heat, and thermal conductivity as a function of x. Now, it's possible that a bar like this could be made of some alloy and the material changes, but for most cases, we assume that the, the bar is uniform. It's made of the same material, the den so the density, specific heat, and thermal conductivity, these things are all constants. In that case, this equation reduces down to this thing here, where c squared is this constant. So usually we write this as ut equals c squared uxx, and this is the heat equation. Over the next few lectures, we're going to do a series of examples that are not all that different from one another. We're going to change one thing and see how it changes the model and or the solution. So here's going to be the first one, example 1a. This is the only one that's going to appear in this lecture. Um, so consider the following initial slash boundary value problem for the heat equation. And I'll explain what I mean by initial and boundary value problem shortly. So this is the heat equation in one dimension. So that, let me sketch that. So that means that if you have a, here we have a bar of length pi and u of x and t is the temperature of the bar at position x and time t. And this is the heat equation that says that this is just the laws of physics, if I think of it that way. Now these are boundary conditions. Let me write that out. Okay, so these are boundary conditions. This says that the bar at position 0 and position pi is fixed at 0 degrees. So here, let's write that as 0 degrees here and 0 degrees there. And I should say that the bar is insulated along the endpoints. And I like to think of the endpoints as, as being open, so the heat can escape out, out of the bar. And then the bar is placed in a 0 degree room. So the ambient temperature is 0 degrees. Some people can think of, like to think of ice packs being placed at the endpoints. And then this is the initial condition. So we've seen this function before. It's a parabola. It looks like this. And so this just says that the initial temperature of the bar is given by this function. So this is like the temperature distribution. The temperature is, is hottest in the middle of the bar, and it cools off as we go to the endpoints. So this is an initial condition. So that's why we call this an initial slash boundary value problem, because it has both BCs and an IC. And these boundary conditions are called Dirichlet boundary conditions, or sometimes called boundary conditions of the first type. And we will see ones of the second type in the next lecture. Okay, so before we begin, let's think about what happens as time goes to infinity. So the heat can escape throughout the endpoints. So that means that, that as time, a few minutes later, the temperatures are going to look like that, and it's going to cool off. And eventually, it's going to approach the steady state solution of zero degrees. So let's write that down just from intuition. From pure intuition, we have that the limit as t goes to infinity of u of x t is, is 0. And sometimes we call this the steady state solution, which is a function of x. It's no longer a function of time because we let time go off to infinity. OK, so let's solve this. We're going to use the same method uh, for every PDE, and it's called separation of variables. So step one, um, we always assume that the solution is of the following form. It is a function of x times a function of t. That's always going to be the first step. And now all we have to do is solve for f and solve for g. Now, I'm not assuming that the general solution is like this. I'm just assuming that there is a solution like this, and we'll actually find many solutions like this. And then we'll use the principle of superposition to add them up. Okay, so before we can 
plug this thing back into here, we need to take some derivatives, and let's do that first. So um, ut is d, d dt of this, uh, well, f of x is a constant, so we get f of x times g prime. So that's just f of x times g prime of t. And then uxx, the second partial derivative of this, is f double prime times g. So that's f double prime of x times g of t. Okay, so now we're ready to plug this back into here. But actually, before we do, I'm going to do a little bit more pre-processing. We don't need to do this at this point, but we will at some point. So I always like to do it first. I like to um, analyze these boundary conditions in terms of f and g. So let's do the first one. u of 0 t equals f of 0 g of t, which is 0. So what does this mean? So we have a, a function g of t, which is non-zero, because we're assuming that our solution is non-zero, a function g of t times some number equals zero. So that number better be zero, right? Function times a number equals zero. That means that f of zero equals zero. Let me just mention that we know that this is not the zero function because initially it's not the zero function, right? So there's no way that g can be zero. And then next we use the other boundary condition, u of pi t is f of pi g of t, which sure looks like a pi, equals zero. And again, we have a number times a function is zero everywhere. The only conclusion is that f of pi equals zero. So I'm going to box these because we are going to use these later. And I like to call these things, um, I like to call these zero boundary conditions. This is my own term. Zero boundary conditions. And it's always a good idea to use these or use these things first and to get these boundary conditions on half. Okay, so now let's let's plug back in. So step two, plug back in. Okay, so ut equals c squared uxx. And c squared is some sort of rate constant, remember? So um, that means this equals c squared times that. Okay, so, so we get that um, f times g prime equals f, not f, c squared times f, c squared f double prime times g. So that's what we get when we plug u back in. And now we we have to separate variables. We've got to put all the g's on one side and all the f's on the other side. In other words, put all the functions of time on one side and the functions of position on the other side. And there's different ways we could do that. Um, there's different places we could stick the, the c squared onto. But here's one way that always works, and I highly recommend it, is just divide by c squared fg right away. So here's c squared fg, c squared fg, and look what happens. The, the f's cancel here, the c squared's cancel here, and the g's cancel there. And we get, we get g prime over c squared g equals f double prime over f equals, well, let's hold off on this for a moment. So this, this thing, this is a function, and it only involves time. So it's independent of position, whatever it is. This does not depend on x. And it's equal to this, this thing, which only involves x, and therefore does not depend on time. So this does not depend on x, and it's equal to this, which does not depend on t, so it's constant. So let's, let's call it a constant. Let's call it lambda. So this is often called the eigenvalue equation. And it's deeper than just the fact that this, this is lambda, which is what we use for an eigenvalue. If you take an advanced course in PEEs, you'll learn about linear operators. And 
these things are eigenfunctions and this is an eigenvalue and it, it really is a it, it it's the same concepts as we're seeing in, in matrix algebra but beyond the scope of this class okay so so what does this tell us this gives us two equations one equation in g this thing equals lambda and one in f this equals lambda so so step three is is we turn our original pde into a system of two ODEs. So we get that G prime equals C squared lambda G. And we get that F double prime equals lambda F. So we get this system of two ODEs. But we're not done yet. This ODE and F is actually a boundary value problem because we have these things right here. So we have f of 0 equals f of pi equals 0. So this is a boundary value problem, and we, we know how to solve it. If you did not watch the last lecture, please pause this and, and watch that, because that last lecture was all about solving these type of boundary value problems. So we got that lambda had to be negative n squared. So for any value of n, we got a value of lambda. And we got that, um, not bn, and we got that a, so for each value of n, we have a solution for x, which is um, some constant bn times sine of nx. So this is our solution to that boundary value problem. And this thing, this thing up here, that's just, actually, let's, let's write this now as, now that we know what lambda is, I'm going to write this as negative c squared n squared g. Now, that, that is just a plain old ODE. And this is initial, not, sorry, it's um, exponential decay. So we know how to solve that. This is g prime equals some constant times g. So we know that um, we have a solution gn of x. So for each n, we have a g. And that, that's some constant. I'm going to call it a because we've, we've used our, our c right here. a sub n times e to the negative c squared n squared t. So there is our solution for g. So to summarize, we are looking for solutions that separate as a product of, of a function of x and a function of t. And it, it, if there is one, it satisfies this equation. And this, this, now we know, must be negative n squared. And that gave us two ODEs, one for f, a boundary value problem, and one for g that we can solve like this. Let me make sure, um, sure that that c in here looks like a c and not an i. So what this means is for every n, we have a solution like this that we're looking for. So for n equals 0, 1, 2, and we can assume that they're positive because n squared is, is, is we get a solution like this for each, each negative n squared. So for n equals 1, 2, 3, et cetera, we get a, a solution, oops, u of n of x t of the form f n of x times g n of t, which is, so let's multiply these things together. Now these are both arbitrary constants, so we don't need both of them. We just need one of them. Um, actually, you know, you know, I'm going to, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to just set both of these things equal to one. So we have a solution of the form. Um, sine of nx e to the negative c squared n squared t. I'll put that back in uh, sh soon. So we, so we have a solution like this. And now by superposition, this is a homogeneous PDE because all of the terms involve u and its derivatives. Any superposition of solutions like this is a solution. So if I have this solution for n equals 2 and one of these for n equals 5, I can take you know, one half of these and one third of those and add them up. 
So, so by superposition, oops, super, fix that a little bit. Superposition tells us that this is going to be a solution. Let, let's take the the uh, infinite sum from n equals one to infinity. I'm going to ignore n equals zero because that just gives us sine of zero, which is zero. So let's take a b n um, sine of n x e to the minus c squared n squared t. Some people like to put the b n in here as well. Um, you don't need two arbitrary constants. If you multiply these together, they absorb. Um, however you want to think of it, this is, we call this the general solution. This is the general solution. And it's the general solution to this boundary value problem. This PDE and these boundary conditions. Notice we have not yet touched the initial condition. So what we have left to do is we have this PDE with this general solution, we need to use this initial condition to tell us what the BNs are. And that is what we will do in the next slide. So thus far, to summarize, what we did is we had an instance of the heat equation. So we had a bar of length pi. Let's write it up like that. Let's put insulation around the bar and say the endpoints are open and the bar is in a room at zero degrees. So this is the PDE that says that we have this one-dimensional heat equation and heat. This is just pure physics and these are the boundary conditions. And we found the general solution, which was this thing here. So at this point, we did not specify what the initial conditions are at all. We didn't use them, but let's suppose that we have this initial condition right here. So the, the initial temperature of the bar is given by this. Now we know what's going to happen. We know it's, it's going to die off as time goes on and the heat's going to escape through the bar. But what we have to do is we have to um, do what we always do, plug in zero into here and figure out what our unknown BNs are. So let's plug, plug in t equals zero. So u of x zero equals n equals one to infinity of bn sine of it. So what happens? Well, the exponential goes to one. So we, we just get this thing and we have to set that, that equal to that, which is x pi minus x. Now, x pi minus x, this is a parabola, and we are being asked to set it equal to a, a sine series, a periodic function. And we know that in order to do that, we need to compute the Fourier sine series of this. So we need to make this into an odd, oops, that's not right, an odd function. So let me write that down. We need, so we need to compute a Fourier sine series. Okay, and, and this is something that we've done. We did this in a previous lecture. Um, I specifically put this example into the, into the lecture on Fourier sine and cosine series because I knew it would come up later. So recall that bn, this is the definition, it's integral from zero to pi of x pi minus x sine of nx dx. So again, if you did not watch this lecture, Pause this and go back and watch that. And this thing here is, it turned out to be four times one minus negative one to the n over n uh, um, cubed times pi. Actually, I think I wrote it before as pi n cubed. It doesn't really matter. So what that says is that um, this, this function here is this sum, one equals infinity of four times negative, not negative one, positive one, four times one minus negative one to the n over pi n cubed sine of nx. So this, this function, 
we have to set it equal to a Fourier series somehow, and we know that its Fourier sine series is equal to this. Therefore, that bn and this, these better be equal. So now we're done. I mean, the, the bn is what we're trying to solve for in the first place. So now we can say that the general solution, uh, no, I don't want to say general solution, that's what we called, that's what we called this, um, the particular solution to the heat equation that satisfies the initial condition, so let's write that down, the particular solution is u of x t equals n equals 1 to infinity. So let's plug in this thing in for bn. So that's, um, oops, um, I should say n equals 1, not, not infinity, 1 to infinity of 4, 1 minus negative 1 to the n over pi n cubed times sine of n x. And so, oh, and what else do we need? We need an exponential here times e to the minus c squared n squared t. So this is our original solution to this initial and value, or initial and boundary value problem. This is it. And let's, let's say a moment about what this means. Um, so at time equals zero, th this thing kills off the exponential, and we have just a Fourier sine series, which is this curve right here. So if I had given you another initial condition, like a triangle wave or something like this, or who knows, something, a square wave, then that would change these coefficients. When you plug in time equals zero, this goes away, and that Fourier series would be the Fourier series of the initial condition. Now, as time goes on, this exponential acts as a damper. It kills off these waves, sine waves, one by one, and it kills off the higher frequency ones quicker because of the presence of n squared. And that makes sense because as, as this heat wave, uh, this is the temperature distribution, heat dissipates. It spreads out, so it gets... It, smaller and smaller, this is like there's a damper on it, and the exponential function is that damper. So this is the solution to the heat equation. That wasn't so bad, was it?